disruptors and curious minds. Welcome to the Thinking on Paper book club. I am Mark. I'm a writer, thinker, researcher, currently exploring uh, emerging technologies impact on business and culture for LVMH and Culture 3. As ever with me is Jeremy, a Nexus thinker, a writer and founder of the Right to Know You program, which I highly recommend you check out. And yeah, the book club. Every week we discuss a chapter of a book we're reading. And this week it's The Design of Everyday Things. Oh, my mirror is not working there. By Don Norman. It's a classic of the design um, genre. We're on chapter three. Knowledge in the head and in the world. It's going to be deep. Jeremy, chapter three. Do you remember it? Yeah, I think so. This one, this this one to me was, oh man, it was it was it was chunky. It was uh, it, it was, was chunky, lengthy. Yeah. It was lengthy. Um, but, Can we fit any more kind of like memory related similes into this? It was chunky, chunking. Can you remember it? Mm. We should have like a ding every time we have like a memory callback. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I guess a good place to start is this whole idea of like knowledge in your head and knowledge in the world. Um, and, you know, I immediately started thinking, I wrote down in the book, uh, above knowledge in the world and I called it distributed knowledge. And like, basically like we all have knowledge in our heads, whether we're building, whether we're creating something, you know, whatever we're doing, we're trying to, you know, distribute that knowledge. If I'm building something, I need to distribute the knowledge in my head of the thing I want to build so that you can use that knowledge in the world to interact with my product. Um, so I don't know, we'll start there and like trickle down. What, what, did, you, what did you think of when he had these two, these two um, knowledge definitions? Well, trying to keep it in line with design, which the book is about design, knowledge in the head, knowledge in the world. So if you have a new device, you buy a new phone, you buy a new, you download a new app, whatever it is, you open it up and then you have two types of knowledge to how to approach this new tool, this new toy, this new app, whatever it is. Um, knowledge in the world is the... Would you say that's what you know from experience of how a certain thing should react? So it's almost like this universal knowledge that everybody knows that this means this and if you click on this green button it means go and if you click on this red button it means stop and whereas the knowledge in your head is something more that you have learnt independently of those universal truths yeah so i, th I start thinking okay. as you say the universal aspect of this it's like a culture kind of thing right so what have you learned via culture and actually just i had this as a note to get into towards the towards the end but probably a good spot to jump into is like you know, the, the, there were, there was a cool, there was a cool quote here to see if I can find it about like how different cult different cultures view different things. Right. Yep. And, and whatever metaphor is being used, whatever cultural reference or metaphor is being used, you know, that kind of dictates how you design something. So like immediately the, the reference of like how different cultures uh, process time and our place in the time. So whether there were two options, as I understood it, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I missed something, but like we, we could be like, there's a person that's fixed and then time moves, right? Or time, the timeline is fixed and you as a person move through that timeline. So two very different perspectives. And if you design something with one perspective, you're going to miss the mark if it, the audience has the other perspective is kind of what I gathered. It's very deep. <laughs> it's very deep to think about. Have you ever found yourself? I don't know. Have you ever been to Asia or Africa and you found yourself experiencing these cultural differences with design where because of the way that the culture thinks about time and the passage of time that you end up not being able to use the technology presented to you or do you have experience of how these big mega corporations like apple accommodate these cultural differences in their design i would say not very experienced in either of those uh domains mark uh i've traveled a good bit but i haven't been to asia or africa um so far out of my cultural realm to like uh to jump into an experience from from a wildly different culture um, what about you? Have you have you run across some of that, and how how have you navigated it? 
or have you have you noticed a disconnect um well i live in france so it's not my the culture i grew up in i mean it's not vastly different to the british culture in many respects but you do i do find myself wondering sometimes why the french do things so differently to to the to the british um but no i, I haven't been to Asia, so I'd like to and get extremely lost and confused by all the design that's there. Um, why is he? Why is he talking about knowledge of the world and knowledge of the self in in regards to design? What 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 can I take? How should I? How should it help me think about when I design things? I think the one of the keys that I took away from it was that you know without both together um you know things don't really things don't really happen the right way right like you you have to be able to you know tap into both of those things within your audience the knowledge in their head and you know the knowledge that you know the general culture or the knowledge of the world is but also knowledge of the world also kind of means like taking the knowledge out of the individual head and putting it into a signifier that lives in in the world like I, ha I had an interesting chat with my my son uh yesterday or the day before right after i had read this chapter and he was struggling with some grades and it all boils down to like him not writing the stuff down that he needs to complete that week in order to you know do the right thing by his grades he's like hey i've got it up here dad i don't need to write it down and i'm like take the burden off of the knowledge in your head and put it into the knowledge of the world so you don't have to work too hard in your memory to remember it. It's actually written in the world now. So that that's how I, I kind of process that in real time, uh, those two things. But it's a signifier, right? Knowledge of the world, it's signifier, right? Yeah, yeah. And th there's when I was reading this, um, he, I don't know if you've seen, there was a film recently called... Um, leave the world behind oh yeah i watched and, it yeah yeah this netflix film about essentially what happens when the internet and technology is removed from our, our life and there was one scene one particular scene in that film where the husband of the guy goes out to try to find somebody and he drives out in his car and the, the big event happens when he's out in his car and he gets lost because he's been following the sat-nav. He has no idea where he is. And his phone doesn't work, so he can't phone anybody. He can't access the geo-positioning. So he's completely lost. And he's completely dependent on that knowledge um, knowledge of the world. And when it's taken away from him, he's, he, he's a fish out of water and he's lost. And I thought that was a very pertinent demonstration of our, how, our reliance on technology. Well, here, here's the, here's absolutely. And I actually really enjoyed that movie. I know a lot of people were pissed off at the ending, but I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed that movie. Um, so Alfred North Whitehead um, was quoted in here. And, and this guy is a you know mathematician, philosopher, interdisciplinary, probably one of the original nexus thinkers, right? This, you know, polymath in between all of these things. But he said that um, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can which we can perform without thinking about them so that that to me points to like well hey we have ways now so i don't need to figure out how to get from a to b i've got all of my phone numbers i wouldn't know your your whatsapp number you know it's in my phone i wouldn't know how the heck to to access that right so there are limitations like if all of that stuff were to go away like in the film we're kind of do back you know do you know your wife's phone number if you get lost or something or you lose your phone or you hurt yourself i know my wife's phone number because that was like yeah that was for some i know my old phone number from like connecticut when i was like yeah. years old if you somehow. hurt yourself you can call your old house and say excuse call me my old house. Here. <laughs> right. i've hurt myself <laughs> no but i i thought that was interesting a reference to 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 whitehead in in that because um there, there are a lot of situations where, and even in product design, like there's a lot of information that's out there that when designing a new product, instead of having someone re-enter stuff, you know, that it just pulls stuff in. I'll give you another example from my life. So I run a, a, I run a youth lacrosse program. There are, you know, a hundred families in this. And whenever you sign up and register for a sport, 
you know, you have to enter like date of birth, you have to enter your address, you have to, and for the people that have been in the program for like three years, they don't want to enter all that stuff again, right? Why not just point maps to it? And that's super simple, but I mean, I think a lot of people don't think about that in product design. No, um, on a daily basis, I'm confronted with bad, well, bad internet design, whether it's filling in forms, where to go, where to click next, where, how can I view my files? How can I view what I want to do? Um, how do I access my web free wallet? Why doesn't it work? Why'd well, have to connect here? Yeah, it's, um, a lot of people could do with reading this book. I have to be honest with you. Chapter three wasn't my favorite chapter of this book. It was, he spent a lot of time talking about memory. So short term memory, long term memory. Um, a few years ago, I became obsessed with memory. So I wasn't this, I wasn't really anything new here for me. And I didn't really enjoy it so much um have you ever read walking um moonwalking with einstein i've heard of it i've never read it though I, I, it's brilliant I, I read moonwalking with einstein it's all about this guy um josh joshua something and he, he he enters the world memory championships and he studies memory and how these memory champions are so good and it's about memory palaces and I, I was like, oh my god! As soon as I heard about memory palaces, like I've got to build a memory palace, and I just, I just obsessed about memory and building my own memory palace. So the short term memory and the long term memory, it wasn't. If you have any knowledge of that, you won't get a lot out of chapter three. I think if if you know nothing about short term memory and long term memory and how it works, I mean, you're a guitarist. I mean, we don't have to talk about short term memory and long term memory to a musician, do you? Because that's what they are. They're just long term memory machines. Yeah, it, I I would agree that this wasn't my favorite chapter either. I think there was a lot of a lot of pages that could have uh, there could have been things said a little little shorter and sweeter. Yeah. Uh, especially for those of us that understand things like short term and long term memory. Um, the thing that was interesting that I pulled out that I thought was kind of fun was, you know, the idea that short term memory, you can, you know, hold five to seven things in there. And but if you rehearse and you create a memory palace or some other mechanic, you can hold maybe up to 12 or 15. Right. But like when you're designing something, the design rule is that you should only expect someone to hold two or three things. Yes. in short term memory. So that was a nice little takeaway that I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, also about like long term memory, which is which is which is really interesting. So long term memory re requires a and I think this is a, a loose quote, requires a reconstruction of knowledge uh, subject to biases and distortions, right? So, you know, we always color memories, right? We, we color the long term memories. And Sometimes when you think about something that happened a long time ago, you may have thought of it and engineered or, or added to the memory in your mind when someone else saw it very differently and they added to their engineered memory, right? So the biases that exist in long-term memory are kind of fascinating, right? Because long-term memories also inform knowledge in your head, right? So how do you, how do you navigate that as a product? designer right with all, all of these biases and, and that sort of thing i don't know i thought i thought that aspect of it was pretty cool do you think that, that plays into brand brand fandom and brand loyalty and that how quickly a brand is capable of getting into your long-term memory maybe maybe once maybe there's a they, these brands that hijack your short-term memory bypass it and give you such a, an experience such a memorable experience that it almost goes directly into your long-term memory and that's where the brand loyalty comes from because your your kind of map of the world and whatever the product is is so linked now to that brand because of their experience or whatever how you want to describe it their product and that yeah that long-term memory plays a role in that Super interesting, right? Like, you know, short term memory, you know, is is like, they're just facts, right? They're just things in there that you remember, hey, I got to push this button to get here, right? That's a that's a quick short term memory thing. But like long term memory ties your experiences and, and stuff into it that that kind of um, engineer an affinity 
for something positively or negatively, which is what you're talking about on the brand side, where all of a sudden you're like, man, why does Adidas feel so cozy to me as a concept, as a brand, yes. or like whatever, right? It's just somehow it got implanted there and someone convinced me that it was mine. And because it's mine, I love it. And I'll defend it against your Nike, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll, I'll be on team Nike then. And uh, yeah. we'll, we'll go against that. Um, I was going to say something, but I've forgotten it because that was my short term memory being hijacked by what you were saying. I had something and it's gone. I didn't, I should have written it down or chunked it. Talking about writing down, that was just a nice segue to what we do at Thinking on Paper. It's we, we write things down to try to understand them more, to try to have them more hammered into our memory so we can kind of take the bits that we want and use them in a more succinct way. A little aside. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so let's let's think about the cultural cultural piece of things, right? You know, cultural metaphors that turn into the ways that people engineer an experience, right? And I know that's very high level, but let's let's talk about like driving on the right side of the road and driving on the left side of the road, right? Okay. You where do you drive on the right or left where you live? Um, in, in France, we drive on the right. And when I go to England, we drive on the left. Drive on the left. Okay. Do you know, so, like a little, do you know why? So this is what I heard. I don't know if this is true. Someone can confirm or deny this, that um, the French and the British drive on the other side of the road because when Napoleon was crowned king, the French, because it was so chaos, chaotic in Paris and horses could go anywhere and everyone did what they want. But because Napoleon was going to have to come through Paris and all the army was going to walk down the street, they decided to have some kind of order to it. And that's when they said, okay, ride your horses on the right. If you get, you know, ride your horse on the right. That's the new rule. And obviously there were spies from England in France at the time in Paris. They saw how efficient and how well this worked. And they went back to London and said, you never guess what the French do. And they were just riding their horses just on the right. And the British were like, awesome, we'll do that. But we'll do it on the left. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I, I love that. That this, that it, it <laughs> it's so petty. <laughs> it is. It is absolutely. But it's also a desire to have something ownable, right? So, like for the brands that are listening, right there, you want to have something that's ownable, right? So, if someone is doing one thing, you know, do you own the other, and does it align and make sense, right? Um, that's really interesting, man. And I, I that was an to... awesome quick thought, Jamie. I love the way you tied that to brand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What one thing that jumped out to me is because I this is a, a major pain point in my life, like major pain point in user experience is, you know, when I go when I go to the bathroom, right, you go go into a bathroom, like public restroom. And there are you go to wash your hands, right? And sink is there and soap is there. And now there's a lot of like automated, you know, faucets and automated soap dispensers. Yep. And when I get into a situation where, you know, sometimes <laughs> I, the sh it doesn't work and there's no signal for like what the right height is and all of that. And I just get pissed, man. I'm like, I'm sitting there and there are like five other people washing their hands down, down the other sinks. And I'm struggling with this thing. I'm looking at those guys and then they leave. I go to their sink and I try and do it in the sink and it doesn't work. So I've run into these loops where I'm like, man, and he references that in the, in the book. And I'm like, yep. Major pain point. I can do a lot of things, but I struggle with motion sensor uh, hand washing. <laughs> I always wonder in those situations at the design table where people are sitting in the office and they're planning and, and, and the boss goes, yeah, is everyone happy with this? And everyone's sitting there going, no, it doesn't work. Um, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, we're happy. And then it just gets yeah. the green light and it goes. Yeah, well, th what do they call that? Like the something of silence, the conspiracy of silence or something? I think it was referenced in chapter one or two or something when people aren't, they're, they're not willing to, you know, go against the grain and be like, yeah, this stuff doesn't work, right? Like, no, it's, well, it's, fine. It's, it's It's like football hool hooliganism, isn't it? It's the, the mentality of the horde, of the group, and where the group intelligence, I mean, not, he speaks in this book about, you know, group intelligence group knowledge being very powerful but on the switch side of that there's this group lack of common sense that can happen sometimes and you see it don't you in crowd trouble but um yep i agree yep. with that 
he speaks he speaks about the one with stoves and mapping and how the mapping of your buttons corresponds to and we can link this back to the knowledge of the world like th- these common sense experiences that you build up over your life so there's no reason if your designers are thinking properly to to get it wrong and, and yet they do with the stoves all the time do you know why i have why? a theory i have a theory what's his, what's especially theory? after reading chapter three what's so theory? the theory is the product designers who have designed the poorly mapped stove controls are struggling with biased uh knowledge in the head that they don't want to change that they think they're right and the knowledge in the head is guiding how they want to product design the product so bad knowledge in the head or calcified beliefs in knowledge of the head calcified beliefs brilliant yes sir yeah calcified beliefs i think that's good enough that's a a good point to end yeah 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 so i think all in all this chapter we you know maybe a little longer than we would have we would have liked but i think there's a couple of good nuggets uh in there that, that that i found uh found as good takeaways but um hopefully the hopefully the next chapter kind of kind of chugs along at it at a better pace what do you think i hope so i mean it's called knowing what to do constraints discoverability and feedback um and the first line is how do we determine how to operate something that we have never seen before well i think so the first three chapters are, are going to give us the answers to that but that sounds fun chap- chapter four next week Join us. See you soon, guys. Bye-bye.